Hello, everyone, and welcome back to A View from Earth, the official podcast of the Fisk Planetarium at CU Boulder. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum. I'm a presenter at Fisk, and I'm an outreach coordinator and some other cool stuff. Uh, and Colin is here with me as well. Hi, Colin. Oh, hey. Uh, yeah, I'm Colin. I am an undergrad at CU. I study astrophysics. I also work as a presenter at Fisk when the building is open. And that's all the hats that I wear. Back to you, hey. Tara. <laughs> I've never actually seen you in a hat, to be fair. That's all right. So today we have something very special for you guys. We are talking to a real live astronaut, a person who has been into space and lived there for multiple days, sometimes weeks or a very long time. Um, so Colonel Astronaut Dr. Jim Voss, uh, we're going to be chatting with him a little bit later and it's super fun. We probably could have made this like a four hour interview had he had the time. He's a very busy man, obviously. So we didn't get him for four hours, but we did get a chance to ask him some questions and it was pretty exciting. Didn't you think so, Colin? I would say so. Yes, I have. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know if this actually happened or if it I made this up as like a weird memory, but I, I remember being at the planetarium and there was this man who I think was trying to tell me that he was a Canadian astronaut. Um, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Other than that one experience, I don't know that I've ever spoken with an astronaut before. So it was cool to, to talk to an astronaut, you know, like face to face. I think we've also had uh, Harrison Schmidt has come to uh, do presentations at Fisk before. So I've gotten to meet him and not have an actual conversation, but just like a hi, shake your hand. I work here kind sure, of thing. Sure, sure. Right, right. Which is still yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well. But it's not every day you get to talk to an astronaut. So this is super exciting. I know John well, was really excited about it too. <laughs> I was. Yeah. I... I, I wrote probably, I think it was 16 questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I spent all of Sunday just doing that. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I, like, like you said, I, I, we could talk with him for four hours and still not get finish up with our, all our questions. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's infinite things you could ask about. So it's super exciting. I wonder if we asked any questions that he had not heard before up to that point. I don't know. I imagine as an astronaut, you, he's probably done a bazillion interviews. Right. Um, so I can't, just thinking about the things that we did talk about, I can't imagine that there was anything that he's never heard before. I wonder mm -hmm. if there's anything that he's never heard before. In fact, astronauts are actually just omniscient. They have heard everything and you cannot surprise them with anything. So that's part of your qualification. It is. Yeah. That's why it's so hard to become an astronaut is that you actually just have to be a god. So <laughs> <laughs> let's not put that out there. Um, I, okay, here's a question. When I like, after I, you know, did the quick little introduction, I said, uh, Dr. Colonel Jim Voss, thanks for being with us. Is there a particular order for which those words are supposed to, like those titles are supposed to be stacked? Or are, is it just like, when you have three of those titles, can people just pick which ones to use and then that's how they address you? Do either of you know how that works? I, I asked that same question when I was writing up the descriptions for the episodes because okay. he does have so many titles. It's like, how, what order does this go in? Right. And from what I was told from several sources, the military title always goes first. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then after that, I think you can decide, but I think it just made more sense to say astronaut doctor rather than doctor astronaut. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, in that case, I apologize to listeners who are aware <laughs> of this rule and then I broke it. I don't know this is a rule. This is oh, just what I was well. told. <laughs> 
but by various members of the military. So sure. Right, right, right. Maybe they're biased. I don't know. Yeah. But you know, I figure it can't hurt. I would like to get to a point in my career where I have like four titles. Yeah. Right. Wheat. Seriously. That'd be pretty sick. Astronaut. That's interesting. You know, up until this interview, I don't know that I thought of astronaut as like a title that you use in a name. Like, obviously, you know, you can be an astronaut, like that's, you know, what you do, but I wouldn't have boxed it together with the other ones. Maybe it's not an official title, but I mean, if Mm. I was an astronaut, I would want that in my title. I want everybody to know I'm an astronaut. (laughs) Do you think that astronauts, like when they like order something from Amazon in the shipping address, they put astronaut and then their name so that their (laughs) driver can be like astronaut Jim Voss, cool, before they set the package down at the doorstep? (laughs) I totally would. You know, when people get their doctor, they're always very excited to put that doctor in front of your name. Right, right. Or like medical doctors, they always put the initials at the end. Mm -hmm. So... I right. put astronaut in there. Heck yeah. 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 I wonder what other titles one could come up with to put undergraduate Colin Sinclair <laughs> in my shipping address. <laughs> Doesn't have quite the ring. Not yeah. quite the same effect. Yeah. yeah, it's not quite as cool. Oh well. Yeah. Uh well, John, it appears that you are actually in space right now. Can you uh, give us a report as to what it's like up there before we do our interview with someone else who also knows those same things? Um, It's very cold. Okay. But it's also very hot at the same time. Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) That's that's it. That's the whole other report. (laughs) Imagine watching the news. Well, it's going to be very cold today but also yeah. very hot at the same time. Yeah. Back to uh, you, Tara. <laughs> at, at this altitude, one side of my body is very hot. The other side of my body is very cold. Yeah. Huh. Mm. Interesting. Well, I guess that's all we've got on this one. <laughs> <laughs> when you, <laughs> yep, what else can was, you say? Yeah, that is a, a pretty clear indicator. Yeah, uh, we can cut some of that stuff out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess let's jump into our interview with Dr. Colonel Dr. Astronaut Jim Voss. Woohoo! All right. <clears throat> Drum roll, please. Today we are speaking with a very special guest. Colonel Astronaut Dr. Jim Voss is a retired United States Army Colonel and NASA astronaut. During his time with NASA, Voss flew in space five times on board the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. He also served as Deputy of Flight Operations for the Space Station Program Mission Integration and Operation Operations Office. While participating in ISS Expedition 2, he and Susan Helms conducted an eight-hour and 56-minute spacewalk, the longest to date. He is currently a scholar in residence at CU Boulder. Dr. Colonel Jim Voss, thank you so much for being with us. Well, it's my pleasure. I always love to talk about space, so uh, glad to answer questions and just chat about space flight. Awesome. Well, I guess we'll get going right away. So, in June of 1987, you were selected as an astronaut candidate. What were you feeling when you got that call? Or, I'm assuming it was a phone call, when you got that information? Yes, it was. It was a great phone call. I was working at the Johnson Space Center, but most of my duties were at the Kennedy Space Center down in Florida, uh, supporting space shuttle launches as an engineer. And I was in my office there, and I got a a call, and the call was from George Abbey, who was the head of flight crew operations. And as soon as he said, uh, as soon as I answered, he said, uh, this is George. I knew then that it was probably a good call because George always called when you were successful in your application. He had someone else call if it was negative. And so I, I, I just said, no, hi, Mr. Abby. <laughs> I didn't call him George at the time. And, and I waited and he said, well, uh, would you like to come and work for me? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, of course I would. And then I was really excited about it. And we, we talked for, Oh, 
maybe 30 seconds. I didn't know what to say other than, yes, God, thank you. I'm so happy to be joining the, the core and I'm, I'll really look forward to doing a good job, that sort of thing. And he didn't have much to say. He was a generally pretty quiet person. And we ended the phone call. And then I just sat there thinking that I had achieved a lifelong dream and I was going to get to be an astronaut. It was pretty exciting. Most of it was all internal there, but it was it was pretty exciting. I can't imagine like what that would be like to have that, you know, that lifelong dream when you get that phone call. I wonder if, you know, because you, you said that he asked, uh, how would you like to be an astronaut? If anyone has ever responded with anything, but absolutely, yes, this is, you know, all I've wanted for so many years. Yeah, most people who apply have that as a dream. And I, I talk to and I advise and coach a lot of people on their applications these days, especially students and former students of mine. And uh, the, the process is so complex. There are a lot of things that people want to know about how to do things and how to make a better application. And I provide advice to them but it's because they have this dream of becoming an astronaut. They really want to work in our human spaceflight program and, and would like to go fly in space. So it is a, a dream that people have. And I shared that dream for many years. I applied five times over a nine year period. So this was a long term uh, dream and desire of, of me to join the astronaut program. When I went to work to, in the, uh, Houston at the Johnson Space Center, it was a, just about my dream came true because I was able to work in the human spaceflight program. I was able to work on space shuttles. I was helping to get them launched and landed. It was really pretty exciting. And I actually wrote a note to myself at some time that uh, in one of my notebooks, I found it years later, that even if I had not been selected, even if I wasn't selected as an astronaut, I would have still achieved pretty much my dream of working in human spaceflight. And I think that a lot of people who, uh, who apply are chasing their dreams, and many will not get there. You have to be very lucky, fortunate to become an astronaut. It's not just because you're qualified. Most of the people who apply meet the minimum qualifications. And then those that get to the interview stages, the 200 or so that they look at every few years, uh, gosh, they're just so, so qualified that any of them would make good astronauts. So there's a little bit of luck involved and a little bit of timing, having the right backgrounds at the right time, that sort of thing that gets someone selected. But I hope that all those who apply and when I talk to people, I tell them it's great to pursue this dream, but if you don't achieve it, try to achieve intermediate goals and, and dreams that you have that'll make you happy and satisfied in life. And is that a common thing for people to apply like four or five times before they get accepted? Yeah, Tara, sure is. There, there are a lot of people that uh, apply multiple times. I, I know there have been a couple that applied more than me, but I'm up there at the top end with five. <laughs> but almost everybody applies more than once. It's fairly rare for someone to be selected the first time. Uh, there are times when that happens, but usually people need a little bit more time to develop their careers and to get the experience and the qualifications that NASA is looking for. It's pretty rare for a, a person in their, uh, their early part of their career to have enough qualifications to be competitive with the others. So talking about your time on the ISS now, now you were out there, you did a couple of missions during your fourth space flight. We mentioned you did a spacewalk with Susan Helms. It still holds the record for the longest spacewalk, eight hours and 56 minutes which is a long day for anybody, <laughs> any job, but I imagine out in space, it feels a lot longer too. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about what that experience is like? And is that ever something that you get used to <laughs> being out in space? Yeah, look, there's a- <laughs> Oh, fabulous. <laughs> a few of somebody doing a spacewalk. Uh, you know, it, spacewalking is one of the, the goals of most astronauts to be able to go outside and to, to be able to work on the outside of, this, of the spacecraft. Oh, eight hours and 59 minutes, almost nine hours, is a long time to be in a spacesuit. <laughs> you know, you get hungry, you have to go to the bathroom, 
uh, you get thirsty after a while, you, you take some water with you in a, a big gulp size uh, container that you have a little nozzle that's sticking up near your mouth so you can take a sip, sort of like a lot of runners or hikers use. But that runs out within the first couple of hours usually because it's pretty dry inside the spacesuit. So you get uh, a little bit dehydrated by the end of a long spacewalk also. Uh, there's the problem of going to the bathroom. We wear diapers these days and they work okay. Uh, usually you don't uh, eat a lot the, the, the day of your space uh, walk, but you still have to urinate and you do, but the diapers work extremely well. The, you also get pretty tired. The spacesuit is an inflated rubberized material structure with other layers of material over it, so it's relatively stiff when it's inflated. So every time you do some action, you move your arm or you squeeze your, your hand, if you grip something, you're working against the suit. So you're kind of working almost all the time doing something. And after uh, six to eight hours, uh, you can get pretty tired. Uh, you don't notice that so much. It's like anything else when you're working and doing things that are pretty interesting or you're focused, you don't notice. But boy, when you're done, it's like, whew, I'm a lot tiger than I thought I was going to be. Uh, after Susan and I did the really long uh, spacewalk, we were pretty tired. Uh, we were uh, happy to just rest and let our crewmates clean up our suits and put things away for us. Uh, we wanted to eat, and then we were just about uh, ready to go to bed after that, after we got over the excitement of, of the day spent outside. But yeah, it's, it can be a little bit tiring, but boy, is it satisfying to do something like that. You spend a lot of time working on preparation for things like that, and you're very uh, happy to get to do them. And I was, I was fortunate to get to do uh, four spacewalks and was really pleased that I got to do them. Is that a scary experience? I imagine stepping out and seeing the planet below you and knowing that, like, that just seems like that would be very uh -huh. frightening the first time you do it. You know, Colin, you really can't think about that too much uh, because there is just a thin material layers between you and, and the vacuum of space. If anything punctures that suit, if you get it cut or anything else, you're very likely to not survive. Uh, same thing with the spacecraft. It has a fairly thin wall. It's probably an eighth of an inch thick aluminum, and it can be penetrated by a uh, micrometeoroid or over orbital debris. If a, a large enough piece hit you, you would probably not have time to react and uh, to do anything. Uh, small leaks, you could respond and you could be okay. But you try not to think about those kind of things. If you did, you probably wouldn't go do them. Uh, it's like many things that we do in life. We weigh the risks and uh, we weigh the benefits of things and the career satisfaction, helping to accomplish our nation to do something very special in space, uh, I felt out weighed the risks. I also knew that the risks were, uh, for this type of thing, relatively low because they, they do a really good job of building our spacecraft. The spacesuits are very well designed. And I had a lot of confidence that unless some freak thing happened, you know, some very low probability of being struck by something, that my training and the quality of the hardware would protect me and that I'd be able to do my job out in space. So generally, you try not to think about those sort of things. There, when I was doing my spacewalks, I was always too focused on the work to be done. Uh, occasionally, I would be able to stop and look around and look at the Earth. Then you're appreciating the beauty of the Earth and looking at it like you would be looking if you were going outside instead of looking out through a window. Uh, there was only one time in my entire spaceflight career when I actually thought about the, the difference in my comfortable environment inside in the vacuum of space outside. And I was just looking out the windows of the space shuttle one evening before going to bed. And all of a sudden it just came to me that, hey, there's vacuum like three inches from my nose. And if something happened to leak our environment out, everybody in here would not survive. And then that, I quickly pushed that away and said, oh, look how pretty the earth is, earth is down there. 
so they speaking about the space suits they give you some training when you go to houston they put you in the big pool and you get to walk around in the space suit and kind of practice this microgravity but how realistic is that simulation once you actually get out into space is it really similar there's a lot of stuff that is similar we do a variety of different kinds of training you can't have the exact environment of space here on the earth but you can uh, have an analog for that or you can mimic it some parts of it in different kinds of training. The neutral buoyancy lab that you mentioned, the great big swimming pool down in, in Houston, you get in the suit and you go in there and you're underwater and things float around and they use plastic tools and stuff like that. So it sort of feels like uh, the real tools will in space. So a lot of that is the same, but you're still in a one G, one gravity environment. So if you turn upside down, the blood still rushes to your head. You still rest your shoulders on the top of your suit and they hurt after a while. You know which way is up. Uh, there are things that are not exactly right. You've got the viscosity of the water that you work against or feel when you move. So those are differences. We also can use an aircraft to simulate the microgravity of space and uh, the, the airplanes that they use do these dives that, uh, that um, give you about 20 to 30 seconds of microgravity so you float around. Then the floating part, being inside a suit, feels exactly the same as you are in space, but you only have it for 20 seconds or so, so you can't do a lot. You can do a few things, but that's an excellent replication of what it's like to be there. You don't have the rest of the environment, and there's no danger involved, so you, you don't uh, have that same feel. But you do a lot of different kinds of training, but we do vacuum trainer training testing in our suit, and that's to experience the, the real danger of being in a vacuum, but to build your confidence in your spacesuit so that you do believe that it's gonna protect you when you're outside. So you combine all those things together and you put it together in your head and it becomes like real spacewalking. And then when you do it, you're pretty comfortable, you've practiced everything and you, you feel like you've been there before. Speaking it's still, of- it's, uh, it's still pretty spectacular when you do it though. Yeah, I, I can't imagine anything really can serve as like a, a replacement for actual spacewalking is, you know, no matter how much practice you do on in, in simulations, <laughs> I imagine spacewalking itself kind of takes the cake. Uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting when you open up the hatch and go outside, though I have to admit on my very first spacewalk, we were delayed going out for a variety of reasons and we were supposed to go out at the start of our daytime, the, the 45 minutes we have of sunlight so that we could see better and uh, work in a, a bright environment. But we delayed enough uh, when we actually went outside, it was after uh, we were in the, the shadow of the earth, so it was dark. We'd also had one of the lights in the, the payload bay of the space shuttle failed early in the mission. So it was a little dimmer out there than it normally would be. So when I opened the hatch and pushed open the cover that my very first thought instead of, oh gosh, what a beautiful view, how wonderful it is to be looking out into space and at the earth, my first thought was, hmm, gosh, it's darker than I thought it would be. Do your suits have uh, lights equipped so that you can you know, look around and, and illuminate your workspace or are there just lights fixed to the space station that do that for you? Yes, we do have lights that are mounted on the helmet uh, if you look at this picture, you can see the, and I'll put my head in the middle of it like I'm inside the suit. The lights are to the side of my head. I have one of the lights on, so and not both. So we're probably getting ready to go into darkness. So it's about to get dim, and they'll, they'll remind you, turn on your lights, it's about to get dark. And one click is one light, two clicks is both lights if you need more illumination. Uh, but yeah, they work very well. They're bright. They provide really good illumination of the space in front of you. It's still dark everywhere else around, but the part that you're, the stuff that you're looking at is very well illuminated. Sure. So, you know, going back inside the International Space Station, uh, in a typical day, what sorts of things does an astronaut do? Can you give us a, a picture of a, a, a typical day on board the ISS? Yeah, we do have a typical routine up there daily and weekly. But every day is different because the activities change. But the, the, the basic core, the boilerplate of your day is pretty much the same. They normally wake 
you we wake up at 6 a.m we would set an alarm and we would get up then we would uh, do the normal morning things turn on computers turn on lights we would activate things that need to be activated for the day we would then do personal hygiene i would usually shave in the morning uh, i would do my my cleanup my sort of shower later after exercising but i would usually shave in the morning and then we would have our breakfast meal we would get an uplink from the ground uh, we didn't have constant communications at the time but we would have been sent up some stuff overnight so we could look at what the daily activities were and what had changed and we would talk about that over breakfast and then we would at 8 a.m we would have our time we would have a teleconference with the Mission Control Center in Houston and at that time we would cover the daily activities and talk about the changes that were made and what we would be doing that was special if we had any special events that we needed to participate in those kind of things uh, and then we would go to work and that, that was the part that changed every day everything before that was kind of the same each day after that we always were doing something else we were building the space station at the time which was pretty much fun it was really a great time to be there. We were always activating new systems, installing new stuff. We were fixing things that broke a lot because there were a lot of things that after they got there, they found that they didn't work quite like they wanted to or normal system failures with new type hardware that had never been flown before. So we spent our day activating things, doing experiments, uh, being a technician for the people on the ground to replace things and fix things. We also had to exercise every day. Two and a half hours are allocated for exercise and, and cleanup. And you kind of need to do that. We would uh, run on the treadmill. We would ride on the exercise bicycle. We would do use bungees for uh, muscle type things. We had a device called a, a resistive exercise device. It was kind of like a weight machine that you could that you might use on the ground that used, used resistive bands, but it was like lifting weights to uh, to exercise. So you could get a pretty good workout in space. A uh, treadmill we used almost every day and we used the weight type device every day. Uh, so we got a pretty good workout. We would stop for lunch. We would then do more of the same activities in the afternoon and then we would have our evening meal. Then usually we'd go back to work and do a couple more hours of work because there was so much going on at the time. And we actually got them to institute a, a new process that we had not done in the past, and that was a task list. It's kind of like a job jar. You have things in there that you can do anytime that it's convenient to do them. They, they're things that don't require support from the ground. It might be a changing a particular filter or doing some activity that you could just go and do. They needed it done. They didn't have time to schedule it, so they threw it in the job jar. It showed up on a list of things for us to do and then we would we would take care of those things uh, we felt like we were going to be there uh, not for vacation we were going there to work we needed to do stuff and we knew there was just so many things they did not have time to schedule and you wind up with about six hours of productive work in a, in a normal work day because of all the other things that have to be done routine maintenance and things like that so the science had to be last. You've got to maintain your spacecraft, you've got to eat, you've got to sleep, those kind of things. And so we did a lot of extra science from that job jar task list. Uh, Susan Helms would spend her weekends working on experiments that, uh, that she was particularly interested in. And we spent a lot of extra hours in the evenings. Then we would try to relax a little bit before we would go to bed. And usually we were scheduled to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night and that would give us a full eight hours of sleep most of the time we did not go to bed until after that we would slow down and and do more relaxing things just talking or looking out the window favorite pastime of astronauts on the space station and and doing other things maybe sometimes playing around with microgravity but relaxing before we would go to sleep and usually about 11 or midnight would, would be when we would actually go to sleep and the Six or seven hours was plenty of, of sleep in space because we slept very, very well there. So that's kind of a typical day. So even astronauts have to do chores. <laughs> yes, we do. But our real chore day, th th those were all kinds of maintenance activities and other things. Our real do our chore day was Saturday morning where we had to clean the space station. 
uh, it was allocated as a cleaning time. They wanted to give you the weekend off, but you got to clean sometime. So ours was Saturday mornings. We took a little more than the morning at first, and then we took a, a lot less later on as we got used to it and experienced and learned all the quick ways to clean our filters and the wipe down surfaces, the disinfectant, those kind of things. Uh, the, the cleaning, we usually assign tasks to different people. One of us would grab the vacuum cleaner and go vacuum out filters and get all the hair and skin and uh, food residue and uh, other things uh, that had gotten in our filters and clogged them up a little bit. And the others would go and wipe down surfaces with fung fungicide or disinfectant. Uh, we would clean up and straighten things that had gotten left out during the week, uh, put things away, that kind of thing. But by Saturday afternoon, the space station was usually clean and well organized and in good shape. Then we would do a little more work if we felt like it off the task list. Sometimes we would do recreational type things. And Sunday we tried to protect for just relaxing, but we always did some work. Every day there was some work to be done. There was just too much to do to take an entire day off. But if we took a couple of hours, uh, we liked it. It was it was very relaxing. Very cool. Now the ISS is pretty much it's a pretty contained environment, and it's also very isolated. And this is a thing that a lot of us are starting to experience now. Uh, we've been in lockdown and isolation for a little while now. Do you think that your time on the ISS kind of helped you prepare for this scenario? Well, and would you maybe have any advice for people who are struggling with this? <laughs> Well, sure. The first thing I would say is that the, the isolation confinement we have down here is not quite as bad as on the space station. There you can't go outside. You can't go for a walk. Uh, you, you can't go visit anyone uh, that you know well. Uh, you can't go spend time with your family. You are truly isolated and you are really confined. The only case of being able to leave would be some real medical emergency probably. And uh, that that hasn't happened yet, so that's why no one's evacuated. So you truly are isolated. You're with the same people all the time, and if you have a family or close friends, roommates, that, that sort of thing, people are around the same people more as they stay inside. There, we had, uh, we were three a crew on board the space station at the time. Now they're up to six and seven a lot of the time. And so we had the same people all the time. That's good because you really get to know your crewmates well, but it's, it wasn't bad, but a, a negative would be that you're seeing the same people all the time. We were, when we first got there, able to uh, call home to talk to our family on Sunday afternoon. And they tried to have video conferences. It never worked very well. The system just was too new and not set up very well. And it usually didn't work. So most of the time we just did telecons. And then we got a, an IP phone that worked through our computer, <clears throat> mostly because of the efforts of an, an astronaut named Marsha Ivins, who had discovered this, told us about it, and we requested it. And they were very reluctant to do it, but Marsha pushed it through and made sure that we got it about a month after we were up there. We were able to plug this in and, and put the software into our computer, and we could call any place on Earth. And that was really great. <coughs> Excuse me. We were able to talk to people, and just like now, you probably do more, uh, more phone calls, uh, more texting, more Zoom meetings, certainly, with other people uh, because you're, you're staying at home a lot more. Well, for us, it was a wonderful thing to be able to do and gave us a lot more psychological support being able to talk to people. It seemed a little bit more like normal life. I think that what I have thought about during this, uh, the, the COVID time, <clears throat> the isolation of folks and not being able to do normal activities is the main thing. You can still go outside some and you can, these days you can even go out to eat if you're willing to, to do that. But you are restricted in your activities and you feel that. And after a while you notice it and you notice you're not being able to do normal life things that you would like to do. So, I think that psychologically affects you after a while. Uh, so I, I think that how we coped with it mostly with our a little bit more severe isolation and confinement was through being active, uh, having stuff to do all the time, 
being really focused on what you're doing. Today, I've got to do this experiment, and that's all I'm going to think about is working on this, or I've got to fix this thing, or I've got to help my crewmate do this. So we really stay busy. And if you are feeling a little bit stressed by, uh, by the confinement and not being able to do normal things, what I recommend is find something to keep yourself really busy, whether it's reading, doing online activities, doing some self-study, cleaning your house, uh, doing those, uh, those hundred things that we keep putting off all the time and focusing on that instead of the fact that you're restricting your activities. I think that that's the, the way to, to take care of that. It can help. <clears throat> sure, sure. So speaking of, you know, this kind of psychological aspect of, of space flight, uh, there's this thing that you've probably heard uh, that people talk about called the overview effect, um, which I understand to be this kind of shift in, in your awareness um, reported by some astronauts, you know, as they kind of look down on the Earth. Uh, did you experience this so-called overview effect? And if so, how did it change your thinking uh, or what did you learn from it? No, I did not. Most people don't. A few people come back with that feeling. Uh, it's just a different perspective of looking back at the earth from, from the way I look at it. It was a very beautiful view and you do see the earth differently than you do from here. But you see the earth differently if you climb a 14er here. It's different and it's spectacular and it's special but it's just a different view of the Earth. The satellite views that we have of the Earth share uh, a lot of things like the, the thinness of our atmosphere, the, the weather patterns that we have, those kind of things. So I think anyone who is prepared to, to think about things differently could have that by looking at the Earth through some of the tools that we have or climbing a mountain, flying in an airplane. It can provide you with a different perspective. And yes, it does do that, but only a few people feel like it changes themselves and their, the way that they really look at the earth, I think. So another thing about the ISS is that it, it really is sort of an international effort. They have people coming from all different countries and you're working closely with people from different countries and different races. Do you think this is something that maybe the rest of society could learn from or maybe anything that you might have learned yourself? Well, I think it's just a good example of cooperation and the way people can work together. We don't pay attention much to what someone's uh, ethnic background, race, color, nationality, or anything else is. Gender, it do just doesn't matter. You're all there to do a job and everybody does their job and you're much more concerned with their professional capabilities than you are with anything else about them. Uh, we learn from other people who have other interests and other backgrounds. And I think that's a very valuable thing. I cherish my time living in Russia while I was training there, getting ready for the International Space Station, because I was deeply exposed to another culture and another way of looking at things. And Russians do think differently about some things and they react differently. Uh, they interact differently. They have different customs and I, I greatly value that, and I think it made me a better human being by having that exposure. So yeah, I, I think that the International Space Station is a really good example of how we can cooperate, how we can get along and we work together, and it's better for all of us if we do that. Something that's always kind of struck me about mm -hmm. this kind of international cooperation is that astronauts always seem to speak more than one language. And there's, I, it feels like, you know, there's always this, you know, potential conversation in like one of several languages happening on board the ISS. Is this an accurate depiction of like, what's, you know, how everyone talks to each other? And if that's the case, you know, what, like, are there any serious language barriers that people run into or is that a non-issue? It, it, it can be, but Yasa Glasson, Yagabadu Paruski, Yamagu Gabriel Druziami, Nanamejdunorodi Kazmichiski Stansi. So I, yes, I, I, I agree that we need to be able to communicate. And I speak Russian and it enabled me to communicate with, with my friends on the International Space Station. You know, it's like any place else. You go somewhere uh, where other people speak a different language, it's better to be able to communicate some in their language as well. If you travel internationally, you don't have to be fluent. 
with the space station, it was important for us to be able to speak Russian pretty well in the early days, particularly because we had to interact with the Russian uh, control center, often independently of our Russian crewmate. Uh, it also allowed us to communicate very well with, with him, uh, Yuri Usachov, who was my, my Russian uh, crewmate on the space station. Uh, language is, is important, and it is important to be able to communicate. And we never spoke only English or only Russian, though English was the language of the space station. We did a mix. We would talk in Russian when I was talking to my crewmate, my Russian crewmate. But if I didn't know a Russian word, I'd just switch over to English and we'd go back and forth. It was um, maybe 90% Russian and 10% English. And he would speak to me in 90% English and 10% Russian. So we'd go back and forth and it didn't seem to matter. And after a while, we weren't even thinking about what language it was. We would just talk and it allowed us to communicate. So, Colin, uh, I was about to say, should we skip to the Capcom and get those on? I think we should. Yes. Okay. So, so let's go ahead and, and, and jump over to the section of the, of the podcast called, we're calling it Capcom Q&A, where uh, listeners will send us their questions for experts and then we'll pass them on to people like yourself. Um, and so this question was submitted, but without a name. This is from an anonymous listener uh, who's asking, the ISS has served us lots over the past few decades, aiding research and experiments of all kinds. With many pieces of the station nearing or over 20 years of age, and in light of the recent leak, would it be viable to use the new generation of super heavy lift vehicles to aid in replacing pieces of the station or create a new fresh station? Well, the space station was designed to last longer than 20 years, and it is certified to last right now through 2024 and some uh, nations have certified their stuff to 2028. The U.S. is going to do that. There, are, There's just work that has to be done to say, yeah, it's going to last that long. It's made out of really good materials, and there's no reason it can't last much longer than that. The things that might wear out can be replaced and have been replaced. We've just got a whole set of new batteries that are better technology as the older batteries started to, to deteriorate a little bit. Uh, we've replaced some solar arrays. There's a lot of stuff that has been upgraded and made better uh, over time. And there's the capability to do that some more. There are discussions now about when the space station will have finished its work and be done. And there's no real agreement on it, but I expect it to go to at least 2028, maybe longer. And there may be somebody that picks up running it later on. I think the Russians would want to stay and continue to work uh, with it, even if the U.S. pulled out. There are also commercial companies that are planning to put uh, modules up there that they can use for commercial research. And that'll probably happen in the next year or two. Uh, and then that will further uh, expand the space station, give it more capability to last even longer. I don't think there's any concrete definite time that it's just going to quit working. Uh, there can be leaks if, uh, in anything like that. I was amazed that there were no leaks initially with all the parts coming from all over the world and being assembled in space. And we had, very, we had no leakage essentially for years. And, and then we just had two instances of small leaks since then. And they've been able to find them and repair them. So Terrence from Boulder wants to know, uh, what personal items are you allowed to take into space? You have very little that you're allowed to actually take personally. On the space shuttle, it would fit in the, the palm of your hand uh, of what you were allowed to take up there. And only two things were allowed to be brought out. I usually took like a, a shirt from uh, a university like CU or Auburn where I went to, to undergraduate school. Uh, and I would take something else that I could put up. Uh, on the space station, we were allowed to take a good bit more. It was a, a, about the size of a very small, very small suitcase. We could take some personal things. And then while we were up there, we were uh, sent some things from the earth. My daughter sent up some stuffed animals for me to uh, float around and entertain myself with. We would get notebooks uh, with notes from friends and family. Uh, I got some additional reading material sent up to me, usually some snacks of some kind like uh, candy, <laughs> things like that. We got popcorn once even. So you would get a few things like that. And then when we returned, 
after accumulating things over a six month period, we were able to bring back three small suitcase size things of uh, the things that we had taken up there. But generally you take personal things. I took a lot of pictures of my family, friends, uh, the uh, environment, my house, things that my dog, uh, things that I wanted to be reminded of while I was up there and I kept them out and rotated them over time uh, on the space station. All right, we have one final question from Charlotte in Austin, who is asking, how do astronauts practice their various faiths aboard the ISS? Well, everyone is allowed to practice whatever faith they, they desire on the, the space station, and they practice it the same way, way that they would here if they were someplace not near a place of worship. And you're allowed to pray if you choose to, uh, you can celebrate any way that you want to. We generally allow for the celebration of religious holidays for all faiths. Uh, NASA tries to be uh, pretty open and, and uh, about that, and we allow the celebration of any faith. And I think we've had most, if not all, most of the uh, different uh, faiths that are where our worship here on Earth have been done in space as well. Great. Well, it's been great talking to you guys. Uh, yeah, thank you so I much. It was a useful podcast for you and that it'll uh, be listened to by a few people. We hope so. <laughs> so Dr. Voss, thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks, you guys. Good questions. I enjoyed talking with you. You too. Yeah. Take care. Okay. I'm going to float away now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So that concludes our very last episode of this round of episodes. So we want to, again, thank Colonel Astronaut Dr. Jim Voss for giving us his time uh, and, and doing it, that interview with us. That was a blast. Um, as always, I want to remind all of our listeners to check out our website, colorado.edu forward slash FISC. You can do a lot of cool things from our website. I can't list all of them because there's just so many. But a couple of the things that you can do is one, send us your questions. If you find yourself asking questions while you listen to these podcasts or otherwise, you know, just in your day to day life, uh, you can send those in and we will forward them to our experts. Uh, that we will interview and, and you can hear your question on the air. So um, send us your questions. Another really great thing you can do from our website is help support this podcast. Uh, you know, this is a, a rough time for everyone. And, uh, and if you feel like you, uh, you know, uh, get a lot out of listening, uh, you can help create more episodes uh, by making a donation to A View From Earth on our website. We can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Uh, this podcast is available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Um, and at this point, stay tuned for the next part of season two. Until then, I wish you all a happy holiday and stay warm over this uh, cold winter season. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time. Mm -hmm.